time discussing breastfeeding and weaning between two populations. I'll spend a bit more time talking about a hunter-gatherer population from California. Then I'll share brand new data from an agricultural population uh, in Bolivia and Peru. That's the result of a collaboration with Kelly Knudsen, who directs the Archaeological Chemistry Lab, and work I've done at the Keck Lab for Environmental Biogeochemistry with Natasha Zolotova. Um, however, before we get into the data, I'm going to give a brief overview of the methods I use to reconstruct ancient diet in people's early lives. So in order to reconstruct the weaning age and diet of ancient peoples, I use two stable isotopes that indicate the protein component of diet that's incorporated into bodily tissues from the things people eat and drink. Um, my main focus today is going to be stable nitrogen isotopes because they display a trophic level effect where the collagen of a consumer is enriched two to four per mil over consumed food. So this tracks trophic levels in the food web. And this holds true for breast milk because infants are consuming human protein when they're consuming breast milk. So they're, they're cannibalizing human tissue. So they're elevated one trophic level above adults in the population. And permanent first molars provide an ideal window into early life since they grow from birth to age nine and accrete dentin in layers, a lot like tree rings, that can be tied directly to an individual's age. So I cross-section the tooth um, and mechanically and chemically remove the inorganic component of the tooth. Um, I cut very thin sections and um, solubilize the collagen. So I, I extract only the protein component of the tooth and um, then run it through a mass spectrometer. So uh, let's see. Oh, that's weird. So before I present my results, I'd like to show you what my data looks like once serial samples from an individual's first molar are run through the mass spectrometer. So I get carbon and nitrogen data back for each sample, um, to which I can assign a numerical age based upon age-related landmarks. So before I reveal any data, um, I just want to call your attention to the x-axis, um, which is age. So each of these samples has been assigned uh, age that this individual was when that section formed. Um, the primary y-axis is the nitrogen, which is going to be our primary focus today. And the secondary y-axis is the carbon. And I'll only touch on that a little bit at the end. Um, so breastfeeding infants are enriched 2 to 4 per mil over adult nitrogen values. So we can see the baseline adult values here. And this is an individual who's breastfeeding. And we're mostly focused on the nitrogen there, which is well above the adult level. And nitrogen will drop during the supplemental feeding and weaning process, typically to the adult baseline levels. And when an individual has reached those adult baseline levels, we consider them to be weaned. Um, and then we can reconstruct childhood diet um, sort of on a 6 to 12 month basis. Um, and typically, infants and young children will be consuming diets pretty similar to that, those of adults. Um, however, this can vary later in childhood as some children begin supplementing uh, provision food with foods they forage themselves. And because most often they're less effective foragers than adults, their diet looks a bit different. Um, but I'm only going to be focused on weaning at this point. This is just to give you a preview of what all this can do. So I want to introduce you to our first study population, which is ancient California. So I have 120 individuals from 10 Bay Area sites across a diversity of ecological zones that span 6,000 years of prehistory. So this is from about 7,000 years ago to right before contact with Spanish. Um, and at contact with the Spanish, this was the Ohlone culture area. And ancient California is a super cool place, and I unfortunately can't spend a whole hour talking about it today. So I'll just give you a super quick rundown. Um, Californians were complex hunter-gatherers. They were egalitarian, and status was earned through wealth accumulation, and they had individual property ownership. There was an extraordinarily high population density at contact with Spanish, supported in part by the acorn economy. And there was extreme linguistic and cultural diversity rivaled only by Papua New Guinea. And uh, California was affected by a worldwide event called the medieval warming period or the medieval climatic anomaly. And I'm just going to call it the warming period from here on out. Um, and this started around 1100 and uh, lasted until 700 BP. And it is obviously associated with warming. 
Um, and also associated with very severe episodic droughts that could vary anywhere from 30 years to 200 years. So in some cases, individuals could see things change dramatically in their lifetime, not for the better. So archeologically, this is associated with pretty drastic settlement and subsistence shifts, increased food insecurity, increased disease, and we can see evidence of this in uh, pathological conditions in skeletal remains from this time period. We also see dramatic increases in interpersonal violence. Um, so one of these pictures is an obsidian projectile point that has um, bisected someone's spinal column, not a survivable injury. Um, and this other person uh, has some pretty serious blunt force trauma to their cranium. So we know that reproductive strategies alter in response to environmental and social factors. And that reproductive strategies and tactics are reflected in parental offspring, investment in offspring. And weaning age is a very good measure of parental investment. So one of my big research questions is, do mothers shift their strategies in the face of climate change, food shortage, and violence? So how did this affect women in ancient California um, who were experiencing these adverse experiences? So before I go further, I want to point out that weaning is a process, not an event. Um, and while I might be pinpointing a single time period in an individual's life where they're transitioning, um, it's not cut and dry. So Dan Sullen's work examining infant feeding patterns cross-culturally nicely demonstrates that weaning is this process and that supplemental foods are initially serving as a top off when infant caloric needs outstrip maternal milk production, but that mothers continue high milk production for long durations after beginning supplemental feeding. Um, and this data uh, of Dan Sullen's from non-industrial societies and my data from the archaeological record refute a common concern in public health that early introduction of supplemental foods necessarily leads to inappropriately early weaning ages. So with that, I will transition to the data on supplemental foods in ancient California. Um, so we can see that there's um, pretty high inter-individual variation in the timing of the introduction of supplemental foods. Um, so on average, it's around eight months um, prior to the warming period and drops to six to seven months um, during and after the warming period. And this is above, this mean is above the World Health Organization recommendation of introduction of supplemental foods at six months. Um, but there's high variation. So people are getting supplemental foods anywhere from three to 12 months uh, of age. So the takeaway from this is that it's highly variable and that these averages may are obviously not telling the whole story here. So what are kids being fed as supplemental foods? Um, what adults are eating, basically, um, which isn't all that surprising. Um, the dietary variation is best predicted by ecology. So if you're living on the Bay Shore, you are eating shellfish and fish as your supplemental foods. And if you're living inland, you are eating uh, plant foods, so ground acorns, seeds. Um, so there's not really baby food. There's adult food or everyone food that's being specifically processed for infants, uh, pre-masticated or pulverized. And in some cases, the way this is being prepared in California isn't any different um, for adults than it is for children. There's a lot of mush. Um, so weaning age uh, does drop during the warming period. There's a statistically significant shift from around 34 to 32 months of age before the warming period to around 24 months of age during the warming period. So this is nearly a year different. Um, and there's no significant increase after the warming period. So there's variation between individuals in all time periods. Um, but I think it's interesting that even though there's this dramatic drop, in all these time periods, parents on average are meeting or exceeding the World Health Organization recommendation of breastfeeding until 24 months of age. Um, and when we compare uh, age at death to weaning age as sort of a broad scale proxy for how um, duration of breastfeeding might impact longevity and health throughout the lifespan, um, we can see that weaning age is a poor predictor of post-infancy survival during the warming period. And this is consistent with the idea that in a time period with high extrinsic mortality, um, parental investment is a poor predictor of offspring survival. And there's generally reduced life expectancy during and after the warming period. <clears throat> 
um, when weaning age is compared to the rates of skeletal pathologies indicative of dietary stress or poor health in early childhood, there's a correlation between reduced weaning age, increased rates of product hyperostosis, and enamel hypoplasia. And these trends in pathology rates have been independently noted in other broad scale bioarchaeological studies in the region, which suggests that just generally reduced access to breast milk increases rates of morbidity early in life. So to summarize my findings from ancient California, um, there's high variability in the introduction, the timing of the introduction of supplemental foods, anywhere from three to 12 months. But on average, um, slightly older than the World Health Organization recommends. And weaning ages are significantly younger during the warming period. So during the stressful time period where extrinsic mortality is higher, women are weaning their children at younger ages. And with younger weaning ages, we see higher pathology rates. And this brings up an interesting point, which is um, it appears that there's health benefits to receiving breast milk past 24 months, which is what the World Health Organization recommends. So um, infants um, way back when were realizing benefits of increased milk consumption past 24 months. So we also know that in addition to negative impacts from adverse experiences like climate change and violence, women's choices to breastfeed and the duration with which they breastfeed are affected by their involvement in their economy, whether it's a wage economy like ours or a subsistence economy. Because time spent allocated to labor in an office or gathering or growing your food can't also be spent on direct infant care. Um, so the degree to which women participate in economies varies cross-culturally and between different subsistence patterns. Um, so in California, women were providing around 80% of the calories during and after the warming period, which is a huge uh, effort on the part of women. Um, so how does this vary in dis different subsistence strategies? And how does women's labor in their respective economies impact their breastfeeding behavior? So now I'm going to transition to South America and talk to you about uh, weaning data from the Tiwanaku Empire, which is an early South American empire um, from around 300 to 1150 AD. And it's centered on the Titicaca Basin um, at the site called Tiwanaku there you see um, circled in red. And this is a pretty high elevation region. Um, and the influence expanded from this high elevation region in the Titicaca Basin down into the Moquegua Valley, which is now also circled in red. Um, and Tiwanaku remained sort of the center of trade and religion. And it's been hypothesized that um, Tiwanaku's power as an empire was more <laughs> religiously and economically focused rather than a military power. And in this region, um, people got their food by farming and camelid herding, but there was craft specialties. So there were people who specialized in textile production and did not produce food. Same goes for pottery, um, a variety of things. Um, so there's a much greater status differentiation we see in this society than among uh, prehistoric California hunter-gatherers. So I'm going to divide the, these Tiwanaku Empire individuals into two areas, the Titicaca Basin, um, or Tiwanaku, and the Moquegua Valley. So I've sampled 21 individuals so far, but sampling is ongoing. And at this point, I have much less sophisticated data than for California. Um, but I have some average weaning ages, um, which appear to be pretty high. So um, among people living in the Titicaca Basin, the average weaning age is around 36 months. Um, and it's a little bit lower, though not statistically significant, in the Moquegua Valley at around 32 months of age. And there is some interpersonal variation, as always. Um, and these averages don't quite tell the whole story. Um, there's some interesting differences in the distribution of weaning age between these two regions. Um, so Moquegua is more or less a normal distribution with people centered on this mean of 32 months. Um, but there's a, I mean, sample sizes are quite small. Um, but there's a semi-bimodal distribution where there's um, one person who appears to have gotten very little investment. They were weaned around age 12 months. Um, and then there are lots of people who were weaned anywhere from three to five years of age. 
Um, so they're continuing to get breast milk much later in life. And um, my sample size is extremely small at this point with only 21 individuals across these two regions, um, pretty evenly split across um, age groups and sex. Um, but there does appear to be differences so far, but the sample size is too small to be significant between males, females, and individuals who did not survive to adulthood. So um, unsurprisingly, as we saw in California, people who uh, died as children had uh, younger weaning ages, and we also see this in South America as well. So reduced investment is tied to uh, greater morbidity and mortality. So here are two weaning charts, like the example I showed you before. So these are sort of two individuals, um, one from each region, that demonstrate this modal pattern of breastfeeding. Um, so here is an individual from Timunaku in the Titicaca Basin. Um, and this person was weaned at around age four and a half. So you can see a very gradual process of replacement of breast milk with foods. Um, and this person over here from Chen Chen in the Moquegua Valley I was weaned at around age two, so much earlier. And it's also worth noting that there are pretty dramatic differences in what these groups are eating. Um, so Tiwanaku, center of the empire, um, some pretty high status regions or neighborhoods in this city. Um, this person is eating a lot of animal protein and they're eating a lot of maize. Um, but Tiwanaku is way too high of an elevation to grow maize. Where is the maize grown? It's grown in Chen Chen in the Moquegua Valley, um, where this person does not appear to be eating this higher status crop. Um, and they're also eating a lot less animal protein. Um, so this person is not getting as much access to breast milk and parental investment, and they're not getting as much access to high status resources. Um, so much more to explore understanding how parental investment and status and access to resources behave in a more complex society here. OK, so there seems to be convergence on World Health Organization breastfeeding and supplemental feeding recommendations by these two different populations in ancient California and the Tiwanaku Empire. Um, but there's high variation between individuals and across time and across cultures. And we see that there is reduced investment in individual offspring in adverse environments. And that current climate change will likely negatively affect infant health. And that there's a need for evolutionary-based uh, public health interventions that target marginalized populations and are sensitive to women's workloads within their specific economies. So I have a million people to acknowledge. Um, the California work wouldn't have been possible without uh, collaborations with Ohlone tribal representatives, um, collaborators in California and Arizona, um, a ton of undergraduate interns, some of whom are here today, um, and many funding sources, and especially a big thank you to SEM for funding my research here. So thank you. Questions? Yeah. Just ask the well, what actually happens when women start providing supplemental feeding? Is it that they run out of milk and their babies are hungry and crying, so they give them other things? What do you think is the actual sequence between the mother and the baby in those circumstances? Well, I think it's a highly negotiated process, but um, oftentimes supplement feeding occurs because infant uh, nutritional needs outstrip the ability of the mother to produce the milk. So she's not ceasing production. She's not ceasing milk production. Um, the infant's needs are outstripping her production. Um, and there are instances where an infant might be sick and have extra caloric needs due to illness, um, although consuming breast milk during infant illness is extremely useful. Um, so there's, I mean, it's, I think it's a constant negotiation between mother and infant about needs. So can I follow up on that? Because I was wondering what, apart from these like biological drivers for what, what drives change, um, what's a cultural driver? Because at least nowadays, I think a lot of women 
don't have this negotiation with their child per se when yeah. they stop breastfeeding, right? And yeah. it's a very cultural, you know, what is what is an, an, a normal age that most mothers in your in your culture are changing? And I would imagine that maybe something similar would have was also happening um, back in the days, and that maybe that what is culturally um, like a normal age is different between these different societies. So I was just wondering, do you, do you know anything about that? Um, so I think the thing that, uh, the data that I have that might speak to that the most is I sort of alluded to the effect, the fact that after the warming period, um, weaning age didn't go back up. So we have the removal of this stressful time period. Why are women still weaning infants so young? And partly it's because there's been this huge cultural change. Um, the economy, the subsistence economy, has transitioned so that women are working themselves to the bone. They're working so hard. Um, they're gathering food. They're processing food. And um, there are these time allocation trade-offs that incentivize women to wean earlier in order to produce the food for their household, um, which, of course, is this feedback loop. Because when you decrease interbirth intervals, um, you can increase fertility and then you have to increase food production. And so there's sort of just been this runaway feedback loop um, after this stressful time um, where there's just been this cultural change in like what women need to do. Um, and so there, there's perhaps less uh, negotiation between mother and infant and women are making the hard decisions that they need to provide um, for their infants with indirect care by foraging instead of direct breastfeeding care. Uh, yes, so you mentioned that during the warming period, there was an increase in interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. And do you have thoughts or ideas, hypotheses about how interpersonal violence could affect breastfeeding behavior? Yes. Um, so there's sort of two levels of violence that are happening in this time period, M might be the best way to explain it. Um, there's pretty systematic um, raiding that's going on by males on other groups living together. So there's this pretty seriously violent male-on-male -male violence competition for resources. These raiding parties, you start to see these mass burials where a bunch of men not from that community are killed and just thrown in a pit together um, and have various pretty dramatic, sharp, and blunt force trauma. Um, there's also just much more endemic violence. So I have a site where there's a two-year-old who's uh, received uh, a dart point, like basically vertically through his body. Um, so there's sort of just this random acts of violence that are endemic. And so I think when you have... Um, you have high extrinsic mortality, both in the form of um, food shortage and increased rates of disease, and then you have sort of unpredictable violence. And you have violence that is being perpetrated by men against men. You create a situation where um, there's, reduced, there's reduced return on parental investment, um, especially for male offspring. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, the drop in weaning age during the medieval climatic anomaly or the warming period is primarily driven by reduced investment in males. Um, so males are being uh, weaned much earlier and receiving less investment, despite the fact that there's advantage to having males defending territory. Their, their mortality is just so high, you shouldn't invest. Yeah. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. <coughs> <coughs> um, so, <coughs> so I have a question for you. Do you yes. have uh, um, fine-grained enough dating that you can tell, you can overlap those infants from, um, from the two sites in Peru? Um, I believe there is rough dating at this point. Um, so for California, I radiocarbon dated every individual and had really fine-grained data. Um, the work that's already been done has more been like this is associated with these artifacts and so it's from this time period as opposed to like direct dating. Um, so these are individuals who are living during a single cultural time period, but I don't have data on whether they were 
like contemporaries within their lives. Okay, I'm just wondering if it was possible that like you know shortages in um, like rainfall shortages led to like decreases in um, you know corn production at one time in one community and then that yeah in both communities. that would be really cool to see. So hopefully I may be able to do more finer grain dating on these, but as of now, no. Awesome. Well, um, uh, please uh, join me in giving a, a warm round of applause for Dr. Thank you. Thank you.